Wow, nice voice. <laughs> Welcome everyone to System Thinking Ontario for March. Um, and uh, we are going to have the usual procedure to, as we have been before. We'll go around and have everyone introduce themselves. Um, I'm actually going to cover some of the content that I put up on the website as a way of priming us towards uh, talking about um, entropy. And then uh, we'll have David Hawk make some comments. He has some history uh, with it. Um, and I admitted before that, and I sent out in the note that I feel very consciously incompetent about um, entropy. Um, I learned about it when I was going to the ISSS meetings, never really understood it, read some more, never really understood it. Not sure if I ever understood it, but I'm not sure if anyone actually ever does really understand it. So if this is new to you, you're not very far behind everybody else. <laughs> and we'll have a great discussion and hopefully Dave will, Dave will clar clarify all that. So let's go around and uh, I think the question for the day will be, um, we'll have people um, uh, answer the question, do you know anything about entropy or what's your exposure to it? Or um, do you have any opinions on it? And let me just open up the um, chat here and I'll go through a list of people, participants. Uh, Gary, say hi. Hi. Um, so I'm Gary Metcalf. I mostly uh, live in Kentucky in the U.S. Um, and in Atlanta part-time. Um, and I'm just looking for a good explanation about why I get more, dis <clears throat> more disordered as I age. So. Uh, thanks, Gary. Uh, Stephen, not Stillette. I'm doing, going down to order here. So Stephen Stillette, <laughs> we'll get to later. Stephen? <laughs> Theodore Agassi. Ah, is that welcome. me? That's you. Glad oh, to well, see you. I'm so glad. Thank you, David, for organizing these meetings. I really think it's wonderful, and we are very grateful to you, truly, uh, year after year. Um, I, I'm a mathematician, physicist by background, professor at Trent University, now professor emeritus, and I am really not interested in entropy. I am interested in negentropy because negentropy is the good stuff and entropy is the bad stuff. And one of the fundamental mistakes is trying to identify the negentropy entropy distinction with order and disorder. That truly confuses things. So if you didn't understand it, you were correct and you showed good judgment. So uh, the point about negentropy is the third law of thermodynamics. The third law of thermodynamics says that life is maintained by eating negentropy. Now, the third law of thermodynamics was stated by Schrodinger, and uh, I really wouldn't want to argue against Schrodinger. So how's that for an introduction to the session? That's like more than I can handle. So thank you, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure we're going to have a lively discussion later. Great, great. Uh, Elena, say hi. Hi, uh, I'm here in Toronto. And I guess I, I first ran into entropy reading uh, Wiener's Human Use of Human Beings about statistical mechanics. And then, of course, there's the physics side. Um, about you know, my copy getting cold. But what I'm uh, most interested in right now is this characterization of disinformation as deliberately feeding entropy into the public discourse. And I'm kind of interested in finding out if anybody else thinks that might be an insight. Thanks, Elena. Emily. Hey folks, uh, I am also in Toronto. Uh, I'm an SFI alumni and I took uh, systems thinking with Peter. Hi Peter, long time. Uh, Peter was also my MRP advisor. Um, I'm currently on maternity leave. So uh, I'm looking forward to, my husband is with the baby. I'm looking forward to uh, uh, not thinking about baby things for at least a few hours. Um, and I first encountered entropy uh, in my undergrad chemistry courses and it's been a while uh, since then. So looking forward to diving into this together. Thanks, Emily. Griff. 
Hey everyone, good evening. Griff, I'm uh, coming in from Guelph, Ontario this evening, uh, and I've been around with systems thinking for a couple of years. I would say at the moment I am uh, entropy agnostic. <laughs> That's a good way of driving it, thanks. <laughs> uh, Jeff. Hi everyone, my name is Jeff Wielden and I live in Brighton, Ontario. And uh, I'm a systems thinker and a friend of a few SFI alum, and so they passed this on to me. Thanks. Uh, Jonathan. I am Jonathan, and I'm connecting for the first time uh, with this group, and I'm based in Geneva in Switzerland, so it's actually quite late for me here. And I'm, I'm, I'm very <coughs> pleased to finally be able to, to take part. Um, I might not stay till the end if it goes on too long. Um, very happy to be here. I, I'm uh, training uh, as a physicist and I've been interested in um, causality and decision making for various reasons, which I'll not get into. And I've been very interested through this in to questions of emergence and reconnected with entropy also myself. Uh, and so this is a topic that uh, I'm quite interested in. Thanks for joining us in the distance. And yes, it's quite late where you are. Uh, Joshua. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a pretty blank slate on entropy. Uh, I don't have a science background per se, and um, just general interest in um, uh, the, the topic, And um, but have been attending uh, the Odd Systems Thinking Ontario event um, for a couple of years now. Thanks, and I'm in Toronto. Thanks. Kelly? Hey, I'm Kelly. I, I'm uh, also coming in from Toronto. I'm just in the middle of transitioning from Alberta to Hamilton, uh, but back in Toronto now. So as far as uh, background, I come from a change background and just trying to catch up on entropy, lots through David Hawk in terms of just threads of information that I don't know that I've woven together yet, but I don't know whether it's part of the reason why I'd be considered a troublemaker because I'm looking in change. Thanks. Uh, Michael. Hello, everyone. I'm Michael. Um, living Guelph, but I'm calling in from Kingston tonight. Uh, I'm a practicing engineer, so I encountered uh, entropy as part of my thermodynamics training. Uh, recent SFI alumni. I'm um, looking forward to the discussion tonight. Thanks. Peter. I'm Peter Jones, professor in the SFI program that's been mentioned. Uh, and I'm interested in, in uh, entropy and order creation and order creation formation of systems of order as a process of design, but also an emergent social structures such as economies, which um, can be thought of when, when, when working with the inputs that are, are put into economies as, as far from equilibrium systems. That is, they, they don't operate at an equilibrium, they require, they're open systems requiring a lot of energy to, to keep going. And, and I'm interested in, in, uh, in, in, in David Hawks, um, interpretations because consider them one of the kind of maybe clearest, I don't know about other living interpreters of Georgescu, Rogen, but you're one of the clearest interpreters of Nicholas Georgescu, Rogen. So interested in, in the discussion. Thanks, Peter. Petri, who has been sending Instagram photos of Lake Superior. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a frozen wasteland. That looks like planet Hoth right now. <laughs> yeah, that's that's where I am. That's just out my window, actually. Uh, so I'm in Guli River. Uh, I'm an AI systems designer. Um, I'm interested in all this stuff. Nice to uh, see you all. Thanks. I miss Robert, Toronto. Robert, if he's not carrying a baby. <laughs> Sure, I'm here. Actually, I was going to try and make a joke about neg entropy and having twins on the way. I don't know if I did that or not, but um, <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I, I in the Toronto general Toronto area, Markham. I I studied 
mechanical engineering. So I guess I bumped into some thermodynamics concepts there, but I'm still holding on to some lots of interesting questions, how energy relates to information and things like Maxwell's demon and these things, but uh, uh, more questions than, than answers, but happy to be here. Thanks. Thanks. Rose. Yeah, hi, I'm in Toronto, and um, I guess I first came to entropy through, um, like Michael, physics training. And I think I first became aware of it as the driver of order and, and creativity from a book I read years ago called Into the Cool, um, and have been interested in that ever since, and, and certainly with the connection to um, ecological economics. And I love this topic. I, I suggested it a few years ago, which led to David Mallory doing a talk. But I'm really looking forward to uh, what David has to say tonight. Thanks. It's, if Rose has read Into the Cool, she's ahead of all of us. Uh, <laughs> Stephen Sillette. Hello. Thanks. Yeah, I'm in Toronto as well. Um, I'm, I, I did get introduced. I did um, physical chemistry in my undergrad, but I thought that was one part of my world that I'd didn't have to worry about and then I suddenly found this came up again because I've been getting into um, multi-scale systems work and active inference um, so basically the idea of variational free energy because originally when I'd done entropy it was all about equilibrium states equilibrium state before equilibrium state after what's the entropy between but the bit in the middle was a bit of a black box and no one knew what was going on so if you've now got dynamic systems now you actually need to work with variational entropy to extract information so yeah i've been getting involved with that and the active inference lab so they work a lot with entropy in different guises uh, or they're trying to but again a lot of questions <laughs> thanks thanks Stephen. tim say hi hey there tim i'm in toronto nice to see everybody um and yeah big fan of entropy always enjoy chatting about how that maps onto these broader topics forward to it thanks umar in the uk hi guys uh my second time here i'm from peterborough uk uh i work at the scrum master but then uh it kind of puts me in the agile workspace and change management and that's where my interest in systems thinking comes and your group has been very interesting and an interesting topics are just here to learn thanks William. Hi all, it's been a long time since I've joined one of these meetings. Um, William, also from Toronto, currently a design researcher at uh, Yelp. Um, and my exposure to entropy, you know, as a kid, I, I was just obsessed with trying to figure out a way to create perpetual motion. And believe me, I, I really tried. Um, then I started studying uh, mechanical engineering where I learned that, you know, um, you know, that we can't really create perpetual motion. So I was exposed to the study of entropy as well. Um, from the perspective of mechanical systems, I remember looking at the entropy equations and thinking about how that might well be the equation that describes the passage of time to the point where I almost got that tattoo to remind myself that time is supposedly irre irreversible. But but anyway, I digress. Uh, then I started the SFI program uh, also with Peter. Hi, Peter. Um, and feeling enlightened by being exposed to system studies and system dynamics. And I started reflecting on energy exchanges across systems, mechanical and non-mechanical, such as economic systems, social systems, and others. Um, yeah, happy to see everyone again. Thanks. Let me guess, Sam. I'm next. Yeah, I've been working alphabetically, uh, so you're last. <laughs> I couldn't have them. This reminds me of my childhood when the teacher would go through the list of students alphabetically. I knew I could tune out for a long time. <laughs> um, I'm a graduate of the SFI program, and I came to Pacific Ontario through uh, introduced through Peter, uh, et cetera. I have very little exposure to entropy or knowledge about it, but from what I understand, it might be interesting. If there's a discussion points that cover off kind of what Elena and Peter were talking about, Elena from the information, Peter from the organizational uh, structure, system organization structure, um, I'm curious to know like entropy and civilization, civilization unit of analysis, because um, I'm just interested in the cycles uh, between that. And our host, uh, Dan, you want to say hi? Just wanted to um, actually 
just say hi to Stephen, Stephen R., I guess. I don't know how to say his last name. The last time I saw him, we were at the CSI building, David. It was a snowstorm, and Stephen <laughs> and I were on the streetcar, Spanaya streetcar, trying to get home. I don't know if he remembers that, but that was a lot of fun. <laughs> so the, and is, that, was, that was one of the most wonderful conversations of oh my goodness. life. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and okay. I would like to thank you very much for that streetcar ride. <laughs> So sort of following on the long topic of Stephen's interest in uh, net entropy, neg entropy, I'm also interested in that area. But another area I'm trying to get a sense of is all the work that David Ng is doing on yin and yang. I'm trying to figure out if entropy has anything to do with that. So I'll be waiting, figure that out. Thank oh. you. <laughs> That's a tough question. Uh, Don just joined us. Uh, Don, do you want to say hi? Hi. <laughs> oh, dear. Sorry about the video thing. Here we go. Uh, yes, you want me to introduce myself? Yeah, the question is, do you know entropy? Right. <laughs> yeah, a, a, dim, a dismal subject. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, of course, like anyone who's interested in general subjects of such, such a sort uh, uh, without any real knowledge of physics, I've always been interested in, in it. And uh, I'm wondering if, uh, from a systems perspective, uh, um, there are more options to think, and other ways to think about entropy. So I guess that's why I tuned in. Okay, thanks. Okay. So, so I'm going to uh, share my screen again, just briefly, and share, um, and go back and just do a quick review of what I posted on the System Thinking Ontario screen, because. Um, for those of us who are trying to get on the same page, we had this uh, nice video that was available on the law of thermodynamics in the economy, uh, which was, uh, I thought, pretty good. Um, it, it went from more of a social um, sense than it did from the usual physical senses. Mm -hmm. Then we went through these list of pre-readings. So um, rather than put people actually through uh, Nicholas or Jesse Rogan, there was a summary article um, that was available and um, in effect, uh, the question is uh, what happens when you actually look at the entropy law and you put it into economics? Um, there's an article by Rogan that was uh, in retrospect. So if you didn't read uh, the original work, sometimes sometimes easier to read backwards. And so from here, we excerpt, I excerpted some of the stuff on classic thermodynamics and what he thought was different about that. Um, now, Peter Corning is a former president of the ISSS, and one of the reasons um, that this, this article goes deeper than I wanted to go, but I wanted to bring out that uh, he talks about the confusion about various interpretations of second law over the years. And so this is kind of the problem I get into when I start seeing systems work, and then the, the topic of entry, entropy comes up is, I'm never quite sure if the person actually understands what they're talking about or not. And so uh, that's why I get a little scared on the topic because it's kind of like, is it, are they saying something that I don't understand or are they actually, do they not understand what they're saying? Um, and then the last article was the, uh, can degrowth be considered a policy option? And, and we get into the ecological economics and how that fits in. And, um, and then from David Hawk, um, in his 2019 book, I actually brought this quote that David had said, entropy, something I had no idea when I was first told, then began to understand it on a second encounter, then I knew I would never understand it when I met it the third time. Then not being able to ever get over it on the fourth encounter um, and, and talked about uh, Einstein and Hawking. And it's like, okay, so with that introduction, I'm gonna throw it over to David Hawk and welcome him to ask, how do we get into entropy and how do we understand it and what do people get wrong? Most important, how do we get out of it? Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm David Hawk sitting here in Iowa, just west of the Mississippi. If you have some idea of where that might be, I'm not sure I do, but I uh, first encountered entropy in 1963 in my first physics class, when the instructor uh, told me in class that I wasn't allowed to bring it up in class, 
That was one subject we would not be covering. There was no point to it. And I should never bring it up again. Thus, I brought it up by every class meeting we had. I would bring it up and ask him if he's still the same. And so I learned about entropy watching him and the class dissolve over the semester. Uh, I never quite got over that and went <clears throat> off on all kinds of tangents. One of which was in 75, uh, the concept of entropy more or less took me off to a funny idea of climate change in 75. So I did a two year research project that ended up in climate change. And of course I was told that uh, that's even dumber than entropy, that uh, that certainly is a non-starter, et cetera, et cetera. And then for my PhD uh, dissertation written in 78, after it was reviewed, I was uh, eventually after a year of review was told that, okay, we're gonna pass it, but you really have to get rid of that stuff on climate change, that that makes no sense. And then of course I knew climate change was worth looking at. But whenever I've told not to do something, of course I know that's where you should look. Uh, not too long ago, I was having a discussion with some company people I advised, and I pointed out that the essence of their marketing, and they market lots of products, the essence of their marketing is neg entropy. That everything they say and do in marketing is neg entropy. And they might sit and think about entropy. Anyway, uh, based on that, entropy got upset with me because I was considered flirting with neg entropy. And that's a no-no. And so entropy removed the capital letters from my name. So now I'm stuck with only small letters to signify my name. So until I get rid of neg entropy, I won't be allowed to have capital D and have capital H back yet. But, but let's see, maybe tonight I can be uh, rectified again and go back to the entropy route. Uh, lots of stuff relative to uh, entropy used in many ways. I never did particularly like the way it was used in cybernetics. I never quite was comfortable with it in the information world. But nonetheless, if it's useful there, why not? Uh, it's just a different construct. Uh, I was particularly enamored in the early 70s with uh, Nicholas Georgescu Rosian, in part because he was such a fascinating troublemaker. And I really enjoyed the trouble that he made. Uh, became friends with him during that time. And then in, uh, I think, 1983, I arranged for a workshop at my university at the time, which would focus on Rosian's work. And it would have economists from 10, 15 different nations attending this workshop to see uh, where economics was going. And I wanted Rosian to be the centerpiece. Uh, unfortunately, National Science Foundation was paying for it. They were footing the bill for the whole workshop and it was their idea. And then when they found out Rosian was coming, they put a hold on the money and said, we can pay no money if Sir Jesse Rosian is going to be sponsored at the meeting. And then I knew, wow, bingo. I knew Rosian was good then. If NSF thought he was questionable, man, that was, I was on a roll then. So then we arranged for other money to pay for him to come and house him. And we did have this workshop which turned out rather nicely. And Rosian gave lots and lots of lectures during those two days, as did many other of the economists that were present. Uh, based on that, we did a number of uh, things, uh, which, well, uh, at least under his inspiration, when I was teaching at Iowa State University, I'm not sure if you've ever heard that. It's, someplace in Ames, Iowa. And I unfortunately had been a student there and graduated from the place. Uh, when I graduated, the engineering faculty gave me the award as the scariest student they ever had. And that was quite an award to get. That was the first and last year, I guess it was ever given. 
And so nonetheless, I didn't have good relations, but a new dean at Iowa State heard that certain professors would resign if I was brought back to teach. And so he came down to the farm and convinced me to come back to teach. These four would resign, he said. And I thought, wow, what an opportunity to make it better. So I did go there and teach. And during that teaching, I did, uh, off in the architecture department, I did what was called an entropy studio meaning how do you bring the concept of entropy into the design of buildings? And I wasn't sure what it was. And the faculty, of course, uh, well, whatever. But the students really liked it and really went whole hog into it. So much so that we were in this um, five-story brand new stretch skin glass building, of course, with no cross ventilation. And the students were learning more and more about thermodynamics. And they were wondering why we didn't have operable windows. So one night the students took out the stretch skin windows and replaced them with Palo double hung windows. Anyway, the Des Moines Register had a heyday with it, destroying government property. Everyone on campus was angry. The president was really angry and somehow use the word entropy a lot. And I'm not sure how they meant it. I'm not sure how the studio meant it. But nonetheless, that became a crucial, uh, shall we say a red line. That was a no-no. Students should never be allowed to do things like that. So in the process of replacing the double hung windows for cross ventilation with the stretch skin glass, the workmen of the university of course broke the glass. It was like 250 pound panes of glass and they broke them. So then the students were charged with breaking government property, et cetera, et cetera. So the final conclusion of that, and there really is no conclusion, but the final conclusion was the student body in the School of Architecture built a three-story soybean straw baled house behind the design center to show as an example of what a house in the future would be like that would do less environmental damage. And it was a fantastic house. Anyway, the angry people got even anger and went on and on and the students were kicked out and uh, I was fired and sent off to better places. But nonetheless, if you have a chance to do an entropy design studio, don't do it. But it uh, causes a lot of trouble and nobody understands what the hell you're doing anyway. In line with that, going back to Rosian, he was always quite helpful and I always appreciated him. And during his stay with uh, me for that workshop, we did a joint paper, uh, assuming it could never be published and we were right. It was called uh, Second Law Economics and it was a paper of humor, humor much more than seriousness. Uh, I think maybe in another 10 years, it might be less humorous. Nonetheless, I always enjoyed working with him, laughing with him. Every year, I think I've mentioned this to a couple of you, but every year he would, as a Christmas present, send me his favorite unpublishable paper that year. And he was really excited about his unpublishable papers and uh, quite liked the man. And sorry for his death. I hear it was a rather bad one. Uh, he died very lonesome, uh, well, least of which would be the Nobel Prize people that were angry at him every year because the Asians would dominate him, Europeans would vote for him, and the Americans were unanimously against him, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That went on for many years. Nonetheless, that only proved that he was onto something. Now, uh, getting back to entropy, uh, Rosian included materials along with energy. And so a number of the negative papers written against him and the negative reviews are how you can't do that. It's only for energy. Uh, since then, there are sort of two reasons why he may have been right. Uh, one was during my two year project in Sweden, we found with the paper companies that you can recycle paper only three times its quality denigrates over time. You cannot recycle paper the fourth time. You simply have mush 
and there was no order in MUSH to turn out more paper. And so we documented and sent that out to the science community and said, what happens relative to entropy in this? Is there a relationship going on here? And the second, second thing having to do with some of the cutting edges of physics these days, uh, began to say that materials and energy are identical. That in essence, all of the uh, uh, fights we had over them being different may not have been accurate after all. So anyway, Rosen eventually is coming into good stead in spite of his tremendous enemies and he had some tremendous enemies. Any questions about any of that? That's sort of a confused preamble. And the part you should remember is entropy took away my capitalized letters. It was not very nice of her. Him, I'm sorry. Okay. Him is neg entropy, her is entropy. We all know that. St Stephen had posted a uh, comment. You want to talk about it, Stephen? Where's... <clears throat> yeah, I mean, there's an interesting thing with neg entropy because if you've with got. Who? I'm sorry? With neg entropy. Okay. Neg entropy is kind of how we interpret certain changes when energy drops in the system because it, the reactants have gone to a product which has a lower energy configuration. So we say, okay, it's had neg entropy, but that's a kind of an average of where we were at the beginning and where we are at the end. But if the process that goes between them is a statistical unfolding of a dynamical nature, then that statistical unfolding is ever only between zero and one. So strictly speaking, you can never actually get neg entropy in what happens in real time. It's just the product is lower entropic products. And if you're dealing with equilibrium states, that's what you have. You have reactants, which are or your start point, which is an equilibrium, and you have your end point that's an equilibrium, and the bit in the middle is not talked about because no one. But if you do nonlinear dynamics, now you're in this realm of being in amongst all that, and it can only go between zero and one. It can't go negative. So you believe neg entropy is possible? No. Okay. I think it's. I think it's statistically, you get the result of an entropic force which can push things in that direction. But in real time, it's a, it's a zero to one statistical process. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments so far? Meg entropy is a lot of fun. You can uh, have a lot of fun with it. With the company I was working with, which makes products, their advertising was implying that they would go forever. They would never need maintenance, never need serviced. They're infinitely long products. So customers should never worry about that. If you step back and look at the ads you see on TV, essentially every product they advertise is that way. David, I wonder if I could just focus the discussion. Yep. Uh, that uh, living organisms are systems. Yep, like you and me. Living organisms are lumps of negentropy. They're what? They are lumps of negentropy. Boy, I hope so. I've been praying to God about that. So uh, the, the, the crucial point that perhaps we could focus on is photosynthesis. That in photosynthesis, somehow, the negentropic force of the sun coming in is turned into large molecules. So I want to dispel the mystery and uh, look at something very concrete, uh, which is the process of photosynthesis uh, as uh, the creation of large molecules which are rich in negentropy. So I'll just leave it at that uh, for now. 
for the moment. The, a, a major point of argument has to do with what is a closed system and what is an open system. And so at least the main definition of entropy deals with a closed system. So many argue uh, since we're in the solar system, we have this thing called the sun, then there's no such thing as a closed system because the sun always brings energy into the earth. And so that is a particular point of view. Uh, the best person, I've ever been around that would say that is wrong. Uh, in other words, he clearly would say it was wrong, was Carl Sagan. But Carl Sagan in 1980, he and I put on a session at the World Futures Conference where we talked about entropy and meg entropy in the universe. And he firmly believes that uh, entropy controls the universe and will take us all the way to the end of the universe but then he postulated, which I've mentioned before to a couple of you, he postulated that maybe at the end, it reverses itself. And then the entire universe is neg entropy and entropy is gone. And he said, why not? But he said, the train we're on is the one headed for uh, entropy and that neg entropy does not exist. It simply is. <laughs> so Carl Sagan. Living organisms, quite... living organisms are lumps of negentropy. And uh, the crucial point where I would focus is uh, photosynthesis. And it's kind of cute, you know, that Sagan suddenly goes up into space uh, when a discussion like that is to begin. It's interesting. Why I mean, does it go off into space when we are trying to talk about photosynthesis? Uh, Boltzmann was big on this topic that you just mentioned. And Boltzmann, vis a vis statistics, uh, could find neg entropy whenever he wanted to. He was rather good at finding it. Rosen had lots of trouble with Boltzmann. Uh, it's interesting to read the two points of view. It's interesting, when I think about Boltzmann, I always think about Robert Musil, their mm -hmm. uh, man Eigenschaft, the man without qualities. And I kind of think of Boltzmann as summarizing the Austro-Hungarian Empire at that mm -hmm. particular moment, which mm -hmm. is random molecules bouncing around. Yes, yes. In the box. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. I want to go back to photosynthesis. Do we have a single biologist in the room? If we are systems thinkers, how come we are not thinking about living systems? And that's a genuine question of mine. It is not a rhetoric question. I really would like people to chip in and let us know about your experience with biology. The third law of thermodynamics says, that life is maintained by eating negentropy. I am alive every single day because I keep eating negentropy. Same thing happens to you. And there's nothing mysterious about either entropy or negentropy. It's just a physical quantity. It's a physical quantity like temperature. So entropy can be high, entropy can be low. Negentropy can be high, negentropy can be low. So the question is this. Do we have anybody in this particular group who has a biology background? I think they died. It's a joke, sorry. We, there are two camps that argue for neg entropy. One is the camp you mentioned, which argues that life is the source of neg entropy. The other camp argues that information is a source of neg entropy. And around each are the people that primarily have degrees in those subjects. So David, my, my introduction, I guess, to this neg entropy concept was somehow related to the question of order, right? So if entropy is an increasing um, dissolution of order, everything is going back to some, you know, the universe goes back towards a heat death. There is mm -hmm. nothing organized anymore. Right. Neg entropy somehow tried to explain. So then how do things get more ordered? Right. 
um, like becoming living organisms. And that may be the bridge to what Stephen's talking about. You know, this, and that, so neg entropy was somehow this placeholder. It, it began to somehow explain within, and, and obviously then energy comes in so that, you know, something energy is required in order to produce more order. <clears throat> but maybe I don't have all that straight. As straight as anybody. <laughs> it's a, it's a tough one that, I mean, even my quite religious friends enjoy talking about entropy. And so for them, uh, entropy is hell, neg entropy is heaven. And so if you put enough energy into it, you'll end up in heaven. And finally you'll have neg entropy. They don't like the idea that uh, entropy affects life and people die. That's just a dumb idea because everybody knows people don't die. Life goes on, et cetera, et cetera. Stephen Salat. Yeah, well, this is interesting. It's always tricky when things get scaled, but in 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 um in terms of like entropy, it's like I say, it's like a flowing river. You can't bottle it. It's not a thing. So, for instance, if I saw actually it was on the post that you said how it could be called uncertainty. So, can you have negative uncertainty? You see, this is the question. That's what I'm saying. It's like so. The question is, what you can have is a variation from the maximum uncertainty and complexity of variable and complexity of variation and you can have a bound on that you can and you can have variation in that but it, it, it never goes below zero in real time now by fluctuating the amount of en there's the, the amount of uncertainty you can then start to gain insights into how something is you can get information out of that because the amount of uncertainty, how much it varies, can give you an indication of how close you are to something. So what, what, what they use in active inference is they talk about informational free energy as opposed to thermodynamic free energy. And then you get into a slightly different game. But um, like I say, in real time, then your, your uncertainty can't become negative but it can become a force in thermodynamics to drive like water becomes ice and then there's a there's a neg entropy process you could call it neg entropy but it just means it's forced it into a state which is which is in a higher energy configuration and therefore it takes heat out of the system because the the energy has gone into the molecules and it's got locked because statistically it's done that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that any point in time, the process that's driving it is, is essentially negative. Um, so let's go back to Clausius, right? Clausius looks at the first law of thermodynamics, energy is conserved. Clausius looks at the steam engine Clausius, being German, uh, is thorough. He says, energy is not conserved. Energy degrades, right? That's how it happened. And he said, you put in energy, which is high quality, and you get out work, which is high quality, and then you get waste, heat, which is low quality. And the poor man, again, being German, focuses on low quality energy. And he has to have a name for low quality energy. And he calls low quality energy high entropy. <laughs> and the poor man doesn't notice that it's the work that's important. In other words, the high quality energy output that's important, in other words, work, and did not concentrate on the good stuff. He concentrated on the bad stuff. And then for a hundred years, 
150 years afterwards, we kept concentrating on the crap, which is entropy, which is low quality energy. So physicists being insensitive to language don't notice that the first law of thermodynamics is contradicted by the second law of thermodynamics. The first law says energy is conserved. The second law says energy is not conserved. Energy degrades. <laughs> the third law of thermodynamics is what's interesting because it talks about living systems. Life is maintained by eating negentropy. In other words, when you are putting food in your mouth, you are absorbing high quality molecules. And if you focus on high quality molecules, you focus on photosynthesis because it is at photosynthesis where the high quality molecules are absorbed. Uh, are you aware of the work of Eunice Foot, F-O-O-T-E? You got me. Who's At the same going? time in 1856, same time, yes. she took issue with that thesis and argued that uh, more important is probably that waste stuff that goes off. And so she put together a model that if you don't worry about the production process or you don't worry about the crap and the low energy, as well as the gases that come off of it, you're headed for trouble. And she articulated that in the process, you create carbon dioxide. Uh, what was Foote's ethnicity? Foote, F-O-O-T-E is her last name. Uh, so what, she was gave, her what was the ethnicity? Uh, I'm not sure, but she was born in the US, I think, uh, upstate yeah, I New York. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly reasonable thing, you know? Yep. If you don't pay attention to washing the dishes, uh, the household disintegrates. Well, Washing she, she, dishes is very important. You want to know what's important about marriage? What's important about marriage is who washes the dishes. Yeah, so or frankly, the divorce. focusing on entropy, I believe, is very important. Focusing exclusively on entropy is uh, strange. Anyway, she, she did a paper on this in 1856. And Thank you very much. I'm going to follow up on that. That's very and she couldn't Thank she you. couldn't present it to AAAS, <laughs> so she had the man sitting next to her present it because women weren't presenting back then. Yeah, and they just thought about weird stuff. Yeah, um, is anybody is anybody familiar with Gibbs free energy? Yep. Tell us yep. about it, please. Anyway, Tell us relative about free energy. Yes, I understand. Uh, I mean, I, I'm quite sold on the entropy construct because of climate change. And it's a terribly good doorway into climate change, which most people don't see the connection, but most people don't see climate change either. I agree with you. In 1972, I was lecturing in a mathematics uh, course at the University of Toronto and the limits to growth came out. And I immediately brought the material into lecture and I said, you know what mathematics is about? It's predicting how humanity is gonna kill itself. Mm. So, so, so yeah, I'm, 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 I'm fully with you when it comes to you know, early detection of uh, generating pollution and pollution does all sorts of interesting things. But still, I'm, I'm kind of wondering about as to why people did not run with things like uh, Gibbs free energy. Maybe you can't sell it. Good point. Can't disagree with you on that. It's this uh, new book I have coming out, which David had mentioned. Uh, I, I think the name is rather appropriate. Short-term gain, long-term pain. And that's mostly what drives humans and including scientists, et cetera, et cetera. That uh, in essence, we are into the short-term gain and so within the book, I describe it as part of the Faustian bargain that we humans make, and it leads to the Faustian tragedy. And for those that have trouble with Faust, they wouldn't like the book. 
those that understand the tragedy uh, would be more interested. But it goes through climate change in some detail on how it's all a Faustian bargain. And most of us sort of know it's going badly. We just spend a lot of time thinking it isn't. Come on guys, say something, girls, doggies, kitties, somebody. I would call on Rose if she actually could remember enough of Into the Cool to make a comment. Um, in, within the ISSS, one of the people that uh, was working in this area cited is actually uh, James Kay, who was involved with the work with Eric Schneider. Um, and so I never had the benefit, I met him I just met him briefly in a uh, conversation, but I never had the actual uh, opportunity to interact with him. So, uh, Rose, did you want to comment on what you actually learned from Into the Cool? Um, it's, I mean, I'd be happy to do that. There is a question in the chat about, so I mean, I'd suggest um, looking at that as well. But um, I guess with respect, I mean, I always, the main thing I remember is just, um, uh, an in-depth look at, um, I guess, dissipative structures. I, I, and so I, when I think of entropy, I think of it as a driver of creativity because a dissipative structure is more complex than, um, uh, than its surroundings. And it's, the, it's created to dissipate energy, that is to create greater entropy, but it, it, it is itself a more complex structure. So they're just that relationship that it's both um, getting more, the, the entire system, the boundary of the system um, overall is more, um, uh, more disordered, but within it, there's increased complexity of the structure. Um, yeah. That's my, that was my big takeaway. And it really affected how, for example, um, uh, models of the economy and whether things like cradle to cradle um, in terms of can not just recycling, but will the material loops work um, were problematic initially. But I guess the other thing that comes, and this is not so much in the book, but different kinds of complexity, like internal complexity, external complexity, and, and how you, yeah, I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> Thanks, Rose. <laughs> David, do you have a comment on that? Uh, I tend to avoid the order disorder aspect because that's not part of the original definition. And I sort of don't need it relative to climate change issues. But in a sense, it's more that you do something and a price will be paid for doing that. And so my concern is with the things that we do that a price will be paid for. So of course, much of the stuff, the industrial system turns out is quite fine, necessary, essential, whatever. But a lot of it is pure junk. And so there's an awful lot of what we do under industrialization that's based mainly on funny wants and not bio needs. And the what's for billionaire life is a uh, sort of a dis discussion. So in doing that, I avoid the disorder order constructs, which information people, of course, use that IT is very much wedded to order disorder because of the cybernetics, Shannon, et cetera. They are in a that direction and simply talk about a decorative quality and so is it worth it was it worth it and uh logic economics group even though in many public founded it or the spirit behind it whatever uh he had nothing to do with it but he uh his expression when he first heard about it was uh, someday you will see ecology eat economics. And so there's not much more to say. 
So in other, in other words, the order disorder is sort of a tangent that's uh, uh, much more for IT and probably not for physics, probably not biology, probably not uh, climate change issues. I, I don't know, that's my feeling, so I, I sort of avoid it, but you, you still use the terms, but I'm not sure disorder is entropy. It just, there's a qualitative difference, which is, I'm not sure I would measure it by disorder. I mean, everyone that opposes me has disordered thoughts. And everyone that agrees with me has a very tight orderly system. And that's all I know for sure, David. <laughs> Could I just hasten to agree with that? Uh, is that there are many different ways of increasing entropy. And one way of increasing entropy is dilution. Mm -hmm. In other words, you're not generating disorder. You're just generating stuff that's more dispersed, kind of runs off into the space of Exactly. So gone. So exactly. I, I wanna I, I wanna affirm that that yep. that you're that you're definitely thinking in the right directions. Um, uh, yeah, it it, yep. it was a mistake to to identify the negentropy entropy distinction with order and disorder. I, I, I agree with that. It, it's a tangent. And the other part difficulty is that we understand entropy much better then we understand disorder or order. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. So it's, I mean, I, I'm not sure entropy is something you can go to a loan officer and get a, a loan with, but at least one of you should try it. Let's, let's see how it goes. Uh, there really are people that have gone to banks with a, basis to create neg entropy. They've actually presented that at the bank and got a loan. Th that has been certified. And in addition, uh, in the early 1930s, uh, enough people had done that, that the federal government passed a law saying it is illegal to patent neg entropy. In the United States of America, when you find neg entropy, you are not allowed to patent it. It needs to be available for everyone without a patent. And so at least our representatives in Congress were taking good care of us back then. And so, you know, if you invent it, you can't patent it, sorry. In the chat, um, em uh, Emily had asked about elaborating on entropy and climate change. Um, Emily, was there a particular direction you wanted to go with that? Yeah, I thanks, David, um, and David for your provocations. I'm interested in, uh, I guess, David Hawk. Uh, you've been looking at this connection between entropy and climate change. I think you said since the '70s, uh, and so I'd be interested in how uh, maybe your perspective has changed or uh, or maybe hasn't changed. Um, yeah, if you could just elaborate, that I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, it, it really hasn't changed. All four of my wives left me they gave up and said it's hopeless and they went away. And so uh, I, uh, it's hard to convince me of much of anything anymore. No, more seriously, the uh, perception is more or less the same. The, uh, in my climate change project, it, it's worth noting that uh, there were 20 companies and six governments that asked to join except one company I asked, then the rest all joined this project that was trying to understand environmental deterioration, where it came from, and was climate change an issue? And so I worked with those six governments and 20 companies where the companies include the major petrochemical companies and chemical companies on the planet. So Texaco, Exxon, et cetera, et cetera. And so during the 70s, when we were coming to some sense of results in this project. And I spent two years going through their plants, refineries, talking to people, interviewing people that, you know, if you saw a problem relative to environmental degradation from something you were doing as a result, what would you do about it? And there we found that the workmen 
had a better idea of what to do about it than the CEO or managers back in head office. They had very little idea. It was amazing how much more workmen knew. Nonetheless, uh, in lots of meetings, we more or less convinced them that climate change was important, environmental deterioration was important, and Exxon was even having a discussion of how to look at alternative energy sources. Can you believe that? In the 70s. The CEO of the time was thinking of doing that. And then this Dr. Black, uh, one of their chief scientists, came out with a remar remarkable paper on climate change and the production of Exxon. And so he was one of the keynote people in climate change that was in this project and wrote something quite sterling. And he was presenting it to the board as part of my project. And the corporate lawyer from Exxon interrupted him and asked him to please stop talking. That if you go on, then Exxon is going to be seen as culpable for this thing you call climate change. So it's best if you just shut up. And so a corporate lawyer trained in a US law school was the leverage with which Exxon began to be a little scared of what it was saying about what it was doing. Then they got a new CEO, of course, from Texas, who brought things back on track. And then Exxon went off to the stars with carbon dioxide. But indeed, back in the 70s, there was some hope. And so indeed, things can change. And sometimes they do. But right now, I'm a, well, <laughs> I, I don't think the body politic is there. I don't think the consumer is there. I think the consumers are still buying a lot of this trash turned out by industrialization that nobody needs, probably nobody wants, and it's just stored up. And we still build buildings trashy, badly, ugly. As a small footnote on that, uh, when I would teach architecture classes, I would teach classes that the great enemy of architecture is Euclid. If you could dump Euclid, you'd be home free. And the worst thing about Euclid is law, I think it's uh, number five, the law of parallels. If you could just get rid of parallels in your building design, you'd have fantastic creations that humans would like, think well and live well. Parallels is what screws up the mental brain. And so please design something with no parallel lines. Uh, based on this, an architect in Finland designed a building called Dipoli. Beside the center, the architect designed it in order to get less and be less drunk. And so if you design this building to be fantastic to be in and feel sort of drunk, you don't need to drink so much. And he was right. It's a fantastic student center. And they started having some advanced engineering courses in some of the rooms in Dipoli. And they turned out amazingly well for getting engineers to leave business as usual and go to business as unusual. It was a basis for creativity, these non-parallel rooms. Finally, engineers took it over and kicked most of the students out because it was too successful. Anyway, there's never been another building quite like that until recently in China. In uh, 2017, a new library was built in a new town, which tried its best to get rid of parallels. And this is a library I've shown you quite often, David. Uh, beautiful, beautiful building. It was specifically designed to try and get rid of Euclid's parallel lines. So we could certainly make much better products with industrialization. But the stuff we're building is, I mean, my God, why do we do it? Why do we buy it? We don't use it, we don't consume it. It sits around, becomes garbage, taken away to a dump or thrown in the ocean. And it just goes on and on and on. So it has to do with the entropy argument relative to getting business as usual to stop doing what it's doing and simply look for business as unusual and make different things, fewer of them that actually mean something.
So if nothing else, think about architecture. Next time you're in a room with parallel walls, it's a joke. Uh, think about Euclid and what he did to you. You probably know in nature, there are no parallel lines. Nature had a better idea. Anyway, now I begin to swear. So I'm gonna shut up because I don't wanna swear just now. David, don't tell them the name of my third book. <laughs> I think I think we'll we'll move on to a comment that um, Jonathan was making on Ashby. Did you want to uh, bring that up, Jonathan? Why not? Um, I, it was a bit out of place, I think, in the end, because it took me some time to type it out. Um, it's my first time attending, so I'm not quite sure how to how to um, approach the, the discussion. Uh, and if there's some specific themes that we have to go for. But anyway, my question is basically goes back to how I got back into st studying entropy about three, four years ago more thoroughly. I've now forgotten most of it, but I was just trying to remember how I had gotten back into it. And there's this article about on self-organization written by Ross Ashby. And there was something very interesting in there that he talks about uh, this a very simple idea for self-organizing systems. And I was interested in this because I was interested in understanding how people uh, make decisions and where goals come from. And um, one of the ideas is that goals uh, are kind of a, a self-organizing phenomenon. And in this article, he says something that I found very surprising and actually I've still not really understood it. He, and it's this sentence I've written here. So every isolated determinate dynamic system obeying unchanging laws will develop organisms that are adapted to their environment. And he further says uh, to explain this, and in fact, this is connected to cellular automatas, is my understanding. And let me just share the rest of the text. <clears throat> In going from any state to one of the equilibria so that was his whole, whole thing was looking at dynamic systems ashby a lot um, the system is going from a large number of states to a smaller in this way it is performing a selection in the purely objective sense that it rejects some states by leaving them and retains some other state by sticking to it so basically he's considering a, a non-ergodic uh, system um, and in such a system, he's saying, okay, you have self-organization. And, and he talks about an isolated uh, determinate dynamic system. And I always, uh, that, I remember when I read this, I thought this is weird because for me in a closed system from physics, we know that entropy either stays the same or increases. It can't decrease, but here we're talking about a decrease in entropy in this particular example. And I, could, I've never really been able to, to um, make sense of, of this because both, uh, both versions kind of make, and I think you, you end up getting into Maxwell's demon kind of issues here and you start looking into, uh, um, the, the, so, so for example, for cellular automata, it's not necessarily true that um, entropy um has to go up if you have a periodic cellular automata obviously the entropy will maybe go up at some point and then go back down to where it was before so this notion that entropy has to increase is uh, not so not so obvious and i've never actually be i kind of dropped it because i never was able to understand this but i i think there's a, something uh, quite deep and interesting there anyway i was just throwing that out there to see if anyone had anything interesting to say about this in fact, that's really mainstream. That's not a tangent. That's terribly important for a lot of people working in the entropy area. Uh, I don't know if you know the name Eric Trist, uh, Tavistock Institute. I don't. In, es in essence, their work on the self-organizing group, or they call it the autonomous work group, came out of the discussion, just like what you said. And uh, uh, Eric was my thesis advisor for the climate change work back in the 70s. But later I found that in essence, his ideas on self-organization uh, came very much from, from the Russian Kropotkin, 
who worried about these things back in the early 20th century. The idea of the self-organizing group to compensate for things getting bad or turning bad. But in essence, how to get beyond leadership, to go to self-organization in order to correct things. And the self-organizing group was something which came out, I don't know, 20,000 BC, whatever. This idea of you don't need a leader, that the group as selves can organize themselves. And so in essence, <clears throat> the entropy argument was it sort of all goes to shit, whatever you do. But in essence, Kropotkin argued that you could go the opposite way relative to these humans that can defy that process. And then Tris set up many experiments to show that was true. So it was actually quite good stuff. And it certainly included the term entropy within their argumentation. And so it's certainly there. So just because entropy is taking place in the larger, larger system doesn't mean you can't play with uh, the neg entropy uh, relative to the social systems. And indeed you need to. But to have a leader say of 10,000 people is not the way to work against entropy. That guarantees entropy wins. That it must be self-regulation, self-organization because that is where the order lies. And so indeed they went through what you just talked about with some amazing results that are almost never applied because they're too successful when they're applied. It scares the hell out of management. The, lots of examples if you're interested. I mean, I think there are, there are two different ways you can look at uh, neg entropy. Or, I mean, maybe I'm not an expert on neg entropy, but uh, as I understand it, uh, a system that reduces its entropy can this can happen if you are an open system, mm -hmm. um, which I think is what uh, I mean. Life and biology were talking about that previously. Um, the common exp explanation is that it's an open system, so obviously the second law doesn't apply in this case. How exactly it all works, obviously, is still a mystery. But um, but then uh, the point that this Ashby is making, I thought, was interesting because it's quite a different argument. It's not about being an open system. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's a computational argument, uh, much the same as what would uh, make for cellular automata, uh, automa automatons. Um, it, it, it's got nothing to do really with if the system's open or closed. It's just got to do with the fact that it's a digital computational system. And um, anyway, and that's um, that's how I was uh, I understood it anyway. There, there might have to be a check there about whether it's um, uh, it's a second law of thermodynamics or statistical entropy. Um, I was taking a data science course in which we actually had to do um, entropy, information entropy. And the thing that was drilled into me is this is not the second law of thermodynamics. Right. Uh, it's a mis misnaming. Right. That, 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 is, that is true, although um, there is a connection that is made through, uh, I mean, um, Cesar and all those guys that were working on Maxwell's demon they, they definitely make a connection uh, in specific systems between these two types of, uh, of entr entropy. And uh, uh, Landauer basically cheats a bit because he, I mean, he makes a connection by, um, he, he basically says the, um, that um, informational, underlying informational entropy, in the end, he, he makes it such that he starts from the assumption that the second law um, is valid to to make this. Um, I, I'm not actually sure what that. Um, it's true. I've heard this argument also before that uh, uh, thermodynamic entropy and information ent entropy are not the same. Although I think you you can make a connection, and anyone who's working on Maxwell Demon type issues will make that connection. If, but, if you'd yeah. like to go deeper in that, there, there is some good material. It began with the Hawking bet with some people at Caltech in I think 2003 until 2006, where in essence that was the argument and had to do with what happens when information goes into a black hole 
and Hawking argued it's destroyed, it's gone. It cannot come out of the black hole. And the other two professors at Caltech argued that indeed you can retrieve information from the black hole. It is preserved and so it is not subject to entropy. That in essence, it uh, it may not be neg entropy, but it preserves itself. And so indeed, uh, two years later, Hawking finally gave in and said, well, I think you're right. And the prize was to give whoever won a year subscription to Sports Illustrated. So indeed, he uh, gave that subscription to the two professors. And then a bit later, one of them wrote back and said, you should have torn it up in pieces before you sent it to us, that we would have understood it much better. Anyway, more recently, a couple of people have now argued again, maybe Hawking was right, that perhaps information cannot come out of a black hole. So it's a, it's a fascinating area to go into, but we sort of don't need that because we notice things dissipate anyway. And we notice that uh, the environment is not very friendly to humans and living systems regardless, even if they're following system sciences, which generally they're not. And so in, in essence, the topic of, shall we say systems theory, system science and deterioration, uh, planet, life, many things is still spot on. Whether we use entropy is an open subject. Um, the reason it's open is because many do not like to see death connected to entropy. That's sort of a no-no. And so they either skip the issue or they pretend they're immortal and move on. And David, that's why I like that other book so much uh, on immortality, hmm. the Pulitzer Prize winning book of 1974. Uh, that's a fantastic book if you're going to think about entropy in life. Good stuff. We'll cover that uh, next uh, next month, I think. Um, Elena had actually injected a question. Is she still with us? I'm still here. Um, I was wondering about noise with relationship, uh, particularly to climate change issues, because much of the information has been countered by opposite information, oblique information, et cetera, uh, which seems to be uh, intended to cause confusion. And I wondered if that was part of, of what you consider to be entropy or whether that's just a nasty self-serving politics. That's, that's, for me, that's just humans being human. And uh, it's quite predictable, forecast, et cetera. And so indeed, going back to the Exxon meeting, uh, indeed the lawyer introduced that, that you know, there was no way to say the scientist was wrong but at least he should shut up. And so indeed he tried shutting up, then he died not long after. That was Mr. Black or Dr. Black. So indeed it's, oh, it's sort of human relations with each other, with nature, with whatever doesn't obey them, including their wives, that it's just human nature, you know that process. It doesn't have to be downhill, but it tends to be. That's why Denial of Death was such a good book. It, that in essence, the author considers that's the source of evil in the world. Peter, you had a contribution here about uh, Bob Logan's work. Well, we actually haven't looked at um, Bob Logan's What is Information? It was uh, supposed to be published by University of Toronto Press at one point, and Greg Van Alstyne and I took it on to publish it as, a, as an online book, but also self-published on the Amazon. Logan developed this, you know, the, the concept that I think was originally formulated by Stuart Kaufman of the propagation of, of organization. That a, a, it's essentially a holistic information theory that applies to, I mean, and, and they don't make an argument for neg entropy but they make an argument for the propagation of order through information in, in by, and it came out of an argument that, that, uh, that essentially uh, the kind of uh, standard physics, uh, well, 
what we believe of standard physics sometimes doesn't apply in the biosphere and in observations and this is a systems biology conference and that biotic information does not follow the Shannon um, hypothesis of, of course, a lot of things don't, but you know, the kind of under underlying um, information theory based on, on, on bit transfer and, and, and information formulated as bits. And so it's a systems theory of, of information in, in biotic information, tech, um, sim, the symbolosphere, which essentially considers language and human exchange, the technosphere or computation, compu computability, and, um, and the econosphere, and say the, the way information is used to trade capital and real assets. And that, that these all bear commonality is the attempt at kind of one of these, you know, it, it didn't develop all the math, but, you know, as a physicist, it was a, it was a kind of a strong position to, to take to integrate um, an information theory across, across the different domains that could start to explain uh, relationships between language, computation, robotics, and the biosphere and, and economies through it through a new information theory that would take that into account. And you can read it online. It's actually written up in a really visually compelling way, and very scrollable. Um, but um, Bob has, you know, it also takes into account some McLuhanism. In other words, this is a, an attempt to create a new medium of, of, of in a sense, it's a a medium of information that replaces Shannon or other information theories. So I wanted to, to just uh, make people aware of that particular, I think, you know, um, the Stevens were talking about information and, and bio and, and the relationship to, you know, to, um, you know, biotic information in, in, in their in kind of the arguments around neg entropy. I'd recommend um, grappling with with Logan's um, what is information. Uh, uh, Peter, could you could you could you just once again repeat the reference there? Oh, it's in the chat. Yeah, uh, what is information? Yeah, by by Robert Logan, is professor of physics at University of Toronto Emeritus. Now he was he was um, connected to our strategic innovation lab for a while, and so we published right, an author. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, also, Peter again. recommended. Uh, Stuart Kaufman, uh, early in your comment, Peter, and yeah, yeah, this Stuart is based Kaufman. On you should take a look at also. Yeah. He's got half a dozen books. He's sort of a good friend of mine. Sometimes uh, we almost have weekly chats or whatever, and he's sort of. I think he believes that uh, life is neg entropy, and that uh, biology, etc. A little bit like Stephen was at in terms of there's much more hope there than I would give it. And so he's I, I, a more optimistic person. I have to confess that I used Stuart Kaufman's book as a textbook in my courses for five years. Yeah. Yep. I, I would too. <laughs> he writes very well and he thinks very well. And on projects, we argue a lot. And he uh, tells a joke about me, not a joke, but true story to many groups that I'm not at. And so my reputation has been somewhat diminished by a joke that involves some, <laughs> anyway, it's, it's for presidents of universities that like sports. He describes me as an enemy of those people and why sports shouldn't be there. And he uses a part of the male anatomy to describe why those people have sports on campus. And I've now heard from quite a number of them that he uses that joke a lot. It had to do with a thing I did for getting fired and why I was in five different court cases around having made that comment. But Stuart laughs his way through that <clears throat> story. And uh, some people have taped it and sent me copies. And so he's hard on me. He's, <laughs> he's not gentle. I, I like him much. He's very good. Stephen Salat, uh, you've been posting various things in the chat. Oh, yeah, I was, um, I was just, in terms of the signal to noise, it could be argued that the signal 
noise is part of the signal in a way so it's more the question becomes about how do you interpret the information in the signal when there's noise but that assumes that there's something coming in which it is in like radar which joshua mentioned we have a signal that's coming in because we've got a dead system here where something comes in and we know what it is we're measuring mm -hmm. but the actual signal that's coming in and you could always argue chemically that's always entropic part of it we're sending the stuff that we're going to interpret the stuff that's bound up that's now staying as potential energy isn't accessible in terms of the reaction it's always stuff that's dissipating that we can then access the stuff that is still kept is still keeping its energy and its potential energy that's not what is the signal so that's the first point is you've got this signal but then the second point is in biological systems the we don't know what our signal we, we have no way of knowing organisms don't know what signals are coming in they don't know everything's random and dynamical and unknown so it's about resolving uncertainty in all the randomness so it's actually using stochastic noise and entropy to get at what might be out there for it to act in the world that's the argument with sort of some of the work around active inference and the free energy principle is it's through action that you resolve uncertainty but you never know you never have a signal coming in you only have action so you're, it's like an interaction with, with which is, is very different to um, a signal, which is, 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 is um, directly either got information or not. I don't know if that makes sense, but this, this, so in some ways you have to be careful that we don't mix the two up because, okay, we're organisms making stuff in the niche, which are radars and stuff, which use information process information and we're trying to interpret the information but then what's happening for us as an organism is 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 seen as more of a, a, an uncertainty resolving dynamical prediction process that's the that's that's the thinking anyway um and that's different so there's no signal for me to read everything is noise that i'm trying to or noise or random dynamical processes which i get more and more purchase on and grip on through action. What do you mean through action? Can you just uh, didn't quite? Yeah, so by acting, you either will see through least action. So with the free energy principle, it looks at complexity and accuracy. Okay, so either the least complex approach to acting or the most accurate to meet my predictions will be um, the one which minimizes free energy the most so you you're, you're forever trying to minimize or create actions which resolve uncertainty in the most plausible way the the complexity could be kind of like an entropy term in terms of the less entropy in terms of how the action takes place or the most accuracy in terms of how close it was to what we predicted okay so um and that's the kind of balancing act that goes on We're... Let's see, I'm checking down through the questions. I think that we've actually gotten through most of them. Uh, we're going to wind down soon. If people have other ideas or haven't spoken, I would like to interject. Uh, it's a good time to do that. I would take to take a poll about whether we're more confused or less confused about entropy. <laughs> supposed to be more confused yes i think i'm more confused now than i was when i started um, i mean i, I mean maybe i have a simple question uh, to to go back to the beginning of the discussion um 
what is really the difference between neg entropy and just saying we reduce the a system which reduces its entropy? Why? I mean, is there a difference or? Uh, neg entropy is reducing the entropy. That's all the, it is, yeah. You know, in essence, think of, you have a can of gasoline sitting there has tremendous potential to do things. You burn it and according to the first law, it's still there, didn't go away. The second law said, yes, but you can't do it again. That it has uh, gone into another form that's no longer available. And so that's quite simple. So taking that to information, instead of the normal discussion about information, you talk about what's usable and what's not. So what's not is noise. So if certain professors are talking in a lecture hall, uh, totally not understandable, we call that noise. But it may not be noise. It just depends on the time period and the context. Relative to the gasoline, uh, there's no yes, but it's simply entropic processes have changed it to another state. It's no longer available to do things. And so that's why when uh, this person, Georges Erosion in this workshop was really hammered by, I think a Swiss economist who really wanted to get into it, that he brought up the same argument. And what do you recommend I do as a person? And Erosion said, I recommend you economize. And the economist said, is that all? And, uh, Rosen said, uh, yes, that's probably all you can do and probably you won't do it. And uh, <laughs> that was the end of our Swiss economist who uh, went away feeling strange about Rosen. But economize means you try to produce those things that give you the most, that which is most valuable to life or support of life. Whereas the junk that's sort of noise and in the way, you know, using Stephen's comments as well as Jonathan, sort of, you know, it's noisy stuff that's in the way. And so Rosen was arguing, let's get rid of the noise. And uh, uh, also I tend not to relate to terms like recycling, sustainability, none of that because second law of thermodynamics is not very happy about sustainability. It, uh, it sort of says you can't go there. It isn't. Uh, recycling really isn't. Uh, it's more marketing than actual recycling, et cetera, et cetera. But it involves humans, right, David? We've all met humans before. Um, to, give, uh, uh, to give a very concrete example, I, I used to earn my living as a systems analyst. And um, the question is, what do you do when you show up at the client's place Monday morning? One group of systems analyst uh, looks around and says, what's wrong with this place? And another group of systems analysts looks around and asks, what is right? Where is the wealth? Where are the resources? Where are the strengths? The first group looks for entropy. The second group looks for negentropy. Second group gets paid better. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry, again, uh, uh, speaking from experience, um, uh, <laughs> one of the best ways of getting fired is figuring out what's happening in a corporation. So yeah. my advice has always been to the students, you're gonna figure out what's happening in about 15 minutes. And once you do it, shut up about it. I, I try to avoid this by never doing what's called consulting for a company. I never consult, I only advise. And I explained to them the difference is as an advisor, I'm allowed to swear at you. As a consultant, I'm not allowed to swear. Otherwise you won't pay me. 
And so let's do advisement. And so in my advisement, I then point out my uh, pay scale and point out that no pay will come to me. It all goes to a charity, either I select it or you select it. So my pay will always go to a charity, not to me. But I am allowed to swear when you do really dumb things. So we find really dumb things. And I tend to do well with the companies that do well. So for example, with one company, I was with them for 15 years as their senior advisor. And during that time, they went from 30 billion a year to 200 billion a year. And have done a lot of very interesting things worldwide. And we're still on good terms and I'm still allowed to swear. And uh, they have changed a lot, particularly relative to climate change. So that's in essence, their number one issue. Whereas some other companies, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's no point. There's nothing to say or do. Uh, as a consultant, they'd probably pay you, but you'd leave shaking your head, wanting to know what that was all about. And uh, it, it's, anyway, the distinction I make between advisement and consulting seems understandable by them. Okay, in the confusion that we've generated, I think I'm going to um, wind down this session. Um, thanks, David, for your commentary. And thanks, Stephen, for bringing in your commentary. Um, for next month, uh, I'm, we are working on something that's related to this. Um, I'm currently working my way through humanism and the question as to whether humanism uh, is helpful or not helpful to the world, uh, in effect, as I'm looking at it. And so uh, I'll be posting that and um, look forward to seeing you next month. Bye. That's nice. Thanks very much. Thank you, David. everybody. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice Thank to you. meet everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, David. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. To you. Very good. Thank you.